0.5% increase to 5.5%. But uh, as we sit, we are at 5%. And on set with me is uh, our business correspondent, Gurpreet uh, Narwan. Uh, Ed Conway is inside the Bank of England and will join us in a moment. The rate hike has come through. It is 5 0.25%. Uh, so it is that smaller uh, rate hike than we got last uh, month, but it is nonetheless another rate rise, a 14th in a row. Gurpreet Narwan, uh, largely as expected, slowing the pace of this uh, rate hike, uh, but uh, we're not done uh, yet, it seems. Yeah, as you said, largely expected this quarter of a percentage point uh, interest rate hike. Now, what we can gather from this is that the bank has taken a view of all the data that we've had so far, and it's made the judgment that it doesn't need the bigger interest rate rise of half a percentage point. Inflation last month came to 7.9%. It fell faster than expected. The bank has taken a view of that and decided that it can actually go for a quarter of a percentage point increase. Just going to bring a few more of these factors here as well, Gurpri. As we know, there's nine people on the committee who all vote as to, to what they want. And uh, the vote came in at eight members uh, voting uh, for that uh, 25 basis point hike, one voting uh, for unchained, uh, unchanged. So uh, perhaps could have expected a slightly bigger sway of people voting um, uh, in favour of a bigger rate hike. So uh, fairly unanimous, uh, the, the decision there, to go for this 25 basis point hike. Fairly unanimous. It will be interesting to see uh, that, who that member was that voted for the unchanged uh, interest rate. Fairly dovish uh, stance. We've got a new member on the Monetary Policy Committee, Megan Green, the American economist. It will be interesting to see which way she voted. But... Uh, for those who voted for unchanged, I think one of the, the key things, one of the key uh, judgments that members of the MPC have to make is that we've already had 14 consecutive interest rate rises. We haven't fully felt the impact of those interest rate rises. One of the major ways that we feel those interest rate rises in the UK economy is through the mortgage market. A lot more people are on fixed rate mortgages now than they were in the past. And we don't know yet what the full impact is going to be because not everyone has come off their fixed rate mortgage. We'll just mention that the British pound is trading at uh, 126.6 against uh, the dollar. It's down 0.4%. It's pretty, pretty much unmoved from before the decision. I guess that highlights the extent to which this was a decision uh, that was uh, largely expected. Our panel's still with us. Uh, Laura Souter from uh, AJ Bell, uh, Iona Bain from Money Expert, and uh, Michael Saunders, of course, a former member of the Bank of England. We're about to be joined by Ed Conway as well, who's rushing outside of the bank. We'll go to him in a moment. But Michael Saunders, just to come to you first of all, uh, clearly the rate hike was as you expected, 25 basis points, taking us from 5 to 5.25. Talk, talk us through the process that this goes about. How, how often do the MPC members argue? Is 8 to 1 quite a unanimous uh, decision? Does it show uh, a kind of consensus with where we are and where we need to get to? Uh, so the vote was 8 to 1 in favour of raising rates, but there's a little wrinkle in this. Two members uh, preferred to raise rates by half a point to 5.5%. Six voted for a rise to 5 and a quarter, and one voted for unchanged. So eight voted to raise interest rates, but of those eight, two preferred a rather larger jump than the 5 and a quarter percent which was the majority choice. But look, the committee would have been discussing this move, this decision, and debating it, assessing the economic outlook uh, for the last week or two, going through all of the details on the economy and the outlook. And it's a fairly lengthy and thorough process, as you would expect for a um, decision of this importance. Gurpreet. But I think it's also Sorry. worth noting there's um, some comments in their language which suggests that interest rates are near their peak. They're saying for the first time they think that monetary policy is now restrictive, bearing down on the economy. And that, I think, is a signal that with interest rates having now gone up cumulatively by more than 5%, and with the lagged effects of that working through, there's quite a lot of restraint coming through on the economy and inflation in the next few quarters. And Gurpri, though, despite the, the language uh, perhaps being relatively encouraging, there's not tons of hikes still to come or tons of big hikes still to come, uh, also suggesting that uh, rate hikes, uh, the, the rate levels are probably going to stay high for a while. Yeah, and I think what's really interesting is that we haven't just got the interest rate decision from the bank. We've also got a huge amount of information in the monetary policy report that is, that is published alongside that. 
that outlines a lot of forecasts about growth and where inflation is going to end up. And there's some interesting stuff that's emerged from that already. Chiefly, that the UK is going to avoid recession. Now, there have been some fears uh, in recent weeks that the Bank of England is acting far too aggressively, raising interest rates when the full impact of these interest rates haven't been felt yet, that it could push the economy into recession. Central bankers are constantly judging that up. They're looking for something called a soft landing. How do we... Um, how do we dampen demand in the economy sufficiently enough to reduce inflation without causing unnecessary damage? The bank today said that the UK would avoid recession, but that the economy would effectively flatline with three years of near zero growth. The other really interesting thing to come out of it is uh, what, the chart, what they had to say on inflation and where inflation is going to end up. Now, as you know, this has huge political ramifications because the Chancellor has made halving, infl halving inflation by the end of the year his chief policy aim. The bank today said that he would narrowly meet his pledge on their current forecasts to halve inflation by the end of the year. They say they see inflation coming in at 4.9% uh, by the end of, year, end of the year. So that's below the halved level that uh, the Chancellor was looking at of about 5.3%. Uh, I know we're going to be able to bring in uh, uh, Ed Conway, who is uh, in the room uh, in just a moment or two. Just worth reiterating the headlines that we've had so far, and that is that uh, interest rates uh, have been increased uh, from 5% to 5.25% by the Bank of England. That was largely uh, as was expected. And uh, Iona, clearly, uh, some of the other headlines coming out of this, Gurpreet were just mentioning, that uh, a recession, at least, is not the base case expectation mm -hmm. from the Bank of England. Yes, but... This year, we've been on a real roller coaster ride. I remember earlier this year, there was a consensus that inflation was going to fall far quicker than it actually has done. And with that, we probably wouldn't see interest rates going up that much further. I remember at one point, there were lots of confident predictions that we wouldn't see the base rate going above 4%. We smashed through that, you know, a few months ago. And that really confirms that anybody who is trying to base their financial decision making on these types of predictions, they're definitely living on the edge. And I certainly would be very nervous about taking out a track and mortgage on the assumption that the base rate's not going to go up that much further. Not because, you know, the predictions right now are necessarily wrong, but just because it's been such a volatile, unpredictable time. Now, we are able to bring in uh, our economics and data editor, Ed Conway, who's uh, just outside the bank on Threadneedle Street. And, uh, Ed, talk us through some of the headline takeaways uh, from the release today. Yeah, I think it's, it's, what's interesting, obviously, so first of all, there's the decision on interest rates, OK? So they've raised interest rates by 0.25 percentage points, a quarter of a percentage point, lower than some people had expected. And, of course, that reflects the fact that inflation, while still very high, isn't quite as, as high, isn't quite as much above expectations uh, as it was uh, not that long ago. So that's the kind of the main uh, thing. The other thing to focus on, because as well as that, you also get the forecast from the Bank of England, you get more signals of what they're planning to do uh, in future. That, in a way, is more interesting this time around. Obviously, there's, there's an instant impact to those interest rates going up, and you will see that if you're on a floating rate mortgage, you'll see that reflected almost instantly. Um, but what's also important is the curve. What's expected off in the future from interest rates? And here... There is something, there is a new bit of language from the Bank of England signalling that they're expecting to have higher interest rates for longer than previously, uh, than they previously uh, might have signalled. Um, essentially saying that even if interest rates aren't going to get up to that level that some people had talked about, getting towards 6%, even if the peak isn't quite as high as had been expected, you can still broadly expect that interest rates are going to be quite high. And what does that mean? It means maybe kind of 5% or so for quite some time. So higher interest rates for longer, maybe not peaking quite so high. But of course, that has a bearing for many people out there, millions of households looking at their mortgages, working out whether they're going to refix now, working out whether it makes more sense to refix in the future. Well, the bank is signalling that actually interest rates aren't going to be going down anytime soon, or at least going down a lot anytime soon. Uh, and that is quite an interesting hint. They're all doing it through the signalling that they tend to do. So it's through various different messages within the minutes. But nonetheless, it's worth taking account of that. And the upshot of that, I mentioned that there are forecasts as well of what's going on with the economy. The upshot of higher interest rates for longer is that it means the economy is weaker for longer. So when you're looking at their growth forecasts, I mean, we call them growth forecasts, but there is no growth in there. It's basically flatlining all the way through for another 
three years, three lost years of growth, some people would say. So only by 2026 do you see anything like relatively strong, and I say relatively, relatively by the standards of the last few years, strong growth. So that is effectively rather depressing. Um, but the good news is essentially they, are, they don't no longer think that inflation is above where they previously thought, and they do expect it uh, to start coming down indeed. Thanks to those higher interest rates, they expect it to be down to around 2% uh, by the end of what they call their forecast horizon. So that's in kind of two, three years' time. But as I say, the messaging is those rates, even if they don't peak quite so high, are going to be high for quite a long time, which, which you know, that's, that's quite significant for many people out there making these decisions. Worth saying, finally, though, Wolf, you know, it's not just about borrowing rates. These are the interest rates that they set here at the Bank of England that then get adopted by banks around the country when it comes to their mortgages, but also when it comes uh, to savings. And for many people who have had to put up with very low savings rates for many years, it is frankly a relief that finally savings rates are starting to go up, albeit not as high as a lot of people would like, albeit that banks aren't necessarily passing on all of those increases through to savers. Um, but there is a large proportion, you know, talking about potentially more than 50% of the population, who are able in to enjoy those savings rates uh, because they've paid off mortgages uh, and they aren't necessarily facing uh, too much in the way of debt. So that's the, the big picture here. We're going to be hearing from the Governor, uh, Andrew Bailey, a little bit later on. There's a press conference. We'll talk to him as well. So there'll be much more detail on this and this is one of those meetings where it's mm -hmm. not just about the number it's about expectations and what you can expect from interest rates going forward um, Ed, do just stick with us. I want to get your response from a couple of statements that we've just had crossing whilst you've been talking. The first one uh, coming from Rachel Reeves, the shadow chancellor, saying that the latest rise in interest rates will be incredibly worrying for households across Britain already to struggling to make uh, ends meet. She says responsibility for this crisis lies at the doors of the Conservatives. Well, the government... The Chancellor's uh, response, of course, as, as you would imagine, strikes a different tone, saying if we stick to the plan, the bank forecasts inflation will be below 3% in a year's time without the economy falling into a recession. But that doesn't mean uh, it's easy for families facing higher mortgage bills, so we will continue to do what we can to help households. Just want to quickly get, Ed, your reaction to those two themes that, that come out of those uh, statements and relative to expectations coming into today is the news that we've had, which, of course, involves another tough rate hike for uh, homeowners, but also involves some different economic forecasts than we had previously. Does it come as a, a slight positive surprise uh, for the Conservatives or as an ongoing disappointment as framed by Rachel Reeves in Labour? Well, I think, you know, if you, if, you, if you listen to what Rachel Rees was saying, I mean, for, for millions of households up and down the country, that is their lived experience right now. You know, a lot of people, and we, we talk to them, you know, all the time, they are looking at their mortgage statements and they're seeing those envelopes coming in with dread because they know that each different decision, and it is a relatively small portion of the population who are on those floating rate mortgages, who so get that impact every single time there's a decision like this. And it's the 14th successive decision uh, that's gone up. Um, that is, you know, an incredibly stressful and financially difficult period. And for those households who are on mortgages right now, particularly those who have big mortgages, particularly those who are relatively young, who have over, well, not necessarily overextended the birth themselves, but extended themselves quite far to get on the housing ladder, to upgrade, to move up the rungs of the housing ladder, this is really tough right now. In fact, you know, it is potentially as tough as it was for families with mortgages back in the late 1980s. Of course, we all know what happened after that. It led to a housing bust. It was really tough. You had negative equity. Uh, you had a recession following it. However, the difference is the number of households who are facing those higher levels of debt, those mortgages, is smaller now, now than it was uh, in the 1990s. And so the upshot is the impact on the economy isn't quite so severe. It's more drawn out. It's less acute. It's more drawn out, which goes back to that point that the bank was making it that, you know, regardless of where those interest rates end up at the moment, even, you know, assuming nothing unexpected happens, and frankly, they've got their forecast wrong quite a few times before, so, you know, we can presume there might be mistakes in the future. Um, based on kind of where things look like they're heading at the moment, it's not about the peak. It's more about the length that we're staying at high interest rates of kind of 5% or so. That is potentially three years of really high interest rates not coming down as quickly as had previously been expected. In terms of the Chancellor, this is kind of significant because 
you'll remember that he has this pledge to try to halve inflation by the end of the year. And actually, the bank has said on the basis of its central forecast, it does look like he will meet that. So he's not going to break that pledge. Uh, that would take that would mean so inflation was kind of over 10 percent when he made that pledge. Um, the, the kind of level at which he meets it is anything below about 5.4 percent inflation, the consumer price index inflation. The bank says it looks like it's around 4.9 percent by the end of the year, but there's still some time. We don't know. Like I say, the inflation forecasting has not exactly been perfect here. Um, and there is maybe a 20 percent chance within those forecasts uh, that he misses it, even if those forecasts are right. So he will be cheered by that. He'll be cheered by the fact that there's no recession, as he mentioned in that statement. But nonetheless, you know, this is not looking at the numbers here. This is not an economy which looks especially healthy. It's flatlining and it's flatlining not just for a few months, but for a few years, even beyond the difficult, challenging times that we've had over the past few years. And so while we have just about got back to the kind of peak in terms of total national income that we had before COVID-19, we're basically now flatlining for quite some time. And when you compare the UK to other countries around the world, particularly the United States, it's not so much the case in Europe. In many countries, many countries in Europe are facing similar issues right now. But the United States is kind of racing away with its economy. The UK is at best stagnating. And that's what you've seen reflected in those forecasts from the bank. Uh, Ed Conway, great stuff. And uh, of course, Ed will be with us uh, throughout uh, the next few hours, including in the press conference with the Governor Andrew Bailey, which starts in uh, about 15 minutes time. My full panel still with us. Michael Saunders, I uh, uh, want to come to you next, a former member of the Bank of England Monetary Policy uh, Committee. And uh, Michael, Ed was talking about the balancing uh, act that uh, policymakers are making. Is it a necessary evil to slow the economy as is happening to push people's mortgage rates up in order to tame inflation? Yes, it is. Um, inflation has been far too high in the last couple of years. And if inflation were to remain well above the target, then the cost of getting it back to the low levels that we've had for most of the last 25 years would just increase further. So we have to get back to low inflation. I do think, though, that Ed made this very important point. The Bank of England having raised interest rates now, what, 14 times in a row? They're looking to transition pretty soon to a period of high but stable interest rates. They won't need to raise interest rates much further because the lagged effects of the previous rate rises, including refinancing mortgages, will continue to work through. But interest rates won't be coming down anytime soon. So you should think of interest rates being around a new normal of perhaps 5% or so, 5-something, probably for the next year or two. Uh, Laura Suiters, also still with us, uh, Head of Personal Finance at AJ Bell. And, and Laura, we talk about all the trade-offs of, of what this massive number of increases in interest rates, 14 in a row, uh, could have led to. One that perhaps could have been worse is the financial markets reaction. We saw in the US some banking issues earlier in, uh, in the year. In that sense, there's been some resilience. I don't think anyone's made a fortune uh, this year. Markets haven't performed that well, and the British pound at the moment is down a third of a percent today, 126.7. But, but financial markets could have cracked much more than they have. Yeah, I think that that is one saving grace. And I think that that's why everyone is so keen to look at what the Bank of England is saying. Now, as you talked about earlier, they don't come out with explicit guidance for future rate rises like we see in the US. But that's why everyone will be poring over these documents today to get some hints of where the bank's going. And so the markets can ensure that they're aligned with what the bank's doing and what the government's doing. I mean, we saw the impact of markets and government and um, policy committees not being aligned after the Liz Trust budget um, last year. And so what we want to see as consumers is that everyone is aligned with what's going to happen. So there's no huge shocks to markets and which have a knock on impact on consumers money as well. Uh, I know all through the lead up, we were talking about where this would play relative to expectations, not so much just for financial markets, but that's such a key factor on how mortgages are priced. Uh, and the forecast as well, perhaps even slightly better than expected on where inflation might go and thus interest rates in due course. And that's critical to, to how banks price their mortgages. Yes, because banks will base their pricing on swap rates rather than the pure uh, rates that we're seeing um, set by the Bank of England. Um, so certainly, as I said previously, there is some optimism. We have seen lenders cut their rates. That won't necessarily come as, as, a, as a big relief for those who are rolling off their rates now and are still going to face a big hike. And I think this whole um, situation creates some very interesting questions around whether affordability tests have really worked over 
over the past 15 or so years. They were introduced after the 2008 financial crash to prevent people from getting into a position where they couldn't afford to pay their mortgage. Now, they are supposed to factor in uh, a rate rise to a level of about 6 or 7% for households. However, it looks like those affordability tests did not take into account high living costs and inflation, which actually seems a little bit bonkers if you think about it, because why would rates be going up? It would probably because, be because inflation is very high. So there will be questions asked about whether um, regulators have done enough to protect households from these rising interest rates, whether there was a little bit too much complacency during the low interest rate era and a feeling that this was going to last forever, this was the new paradigm, and therefore we didn't need to worry too much about rising rates. Well, now that that new normal is here that Ed Conway was describing before. Um, how well are households going to cope with it? So far, repossessions have been relatively low and we've seen um, lenders agree with the government this new mortgage charter where people can extend their mortgage term, they can go on to interest-only mortgages uh, and that shouldn't affect their credit score. It's very much a short-term measure though, only lasts six months and after that people will still have to come up with a plan for paying their mortgage. So we're going to have to wait and see just how widespread the pain will be. We're going to take a very quick break here. In eight minutes' time is the press conference with the Bank of England Governor, uh, Andrew Bailey. We'll have a, a preview uh, of that with our expert panel uh, after this short break. This is how we do it. It's Friday night. Kingdom. These last few years have seen some huge stories. And these stories have been driven by politics, by politicians, the people in power. You must stay at home. And it's my job to figure out how these decisions made by politicians impact all of us in our everyday lives. This is the worst thing I've ever been through in my life. People turn up here with their child stuff in a black sack and just say, I don't want to. And that is what it is. It's, it's first class poverty. Is this an example? Join the conversation. Put your comments and suggestions below in the comment section. Thank you for subscribing to this news channel. You will be notified of any breaking news and new post as you become part and parcel of the TAO Media family. Please like and share TAO Media. We love you all. Please support TAO Media Foundation by joining membership and visiting Amazon UK to purchase the displayed books to aid our orphanage projects across Africa.